I suppose we should begin, and as always, we should begin with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings. What an awesome God you are. We are grateful that you are so good. And as we uh, come to contemplate these things, we seek to understand better how you've made us, uh, what, how we're supposed to function, and how you desire to return us to function. <clears throat> we just ask for you, the guiding of your Holy Spirit and for you to work out your perfect will and way. And we thank you for doing so. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, um, yes, this is going to be coming out of the Law of Life book. And uh, again, a familiar analogy for, for many of you that have seen the Law of Life. Some of you haven't. And um, well, we're just going to, again, cover this stuff again, uh, refresh our memories, and then that will provide some fodder for us to ask questions. Uh, the tree here, of course, represents health. And each different part of it has its different components. And in this particular analogy, the the fruit and the leaves that you see here's a section with uh, some bad fruit and bad leaves well that represents symptoms and the symptoms can be varied you have things like pain and coughing and itching you can have uh, sore throat runny nose you can have um, you know diarrhea constipation whatever there's all sorts of symptoms that an individual can have and by its very nature, symptoms are uncomfortable. And that's on a purpose, that's on purpose because the, the symptoms are there to help us know that something is wrong. It's a warning sign that something is wrong. And um, you know, what we usually do in our in our American context, at least in Western context as a whole is we tend to uh, treat symptoms with something like medication. Now, there's a, a strong trend in the direction of natural remedies and herbal remedies and, um, you know, essential oils and other things of that nature. Um, so that has taken a strong uh, root in America. Uh, it's been very strong in other countries and other cultures uh, for a long time. And so not only can you find a pill for every ill in the pharmacy, but you can find a pill for every ill in the health food store. Uh, and it's just as easy to take one pill as it is the other. Does that mean that there are not differences between them? Well, there are. <clears throat> the stronger the uh, the substance, typically, the stronger the side effects if the substance does not take away the, the cause. Um, and, uh, and then the more processed it is, usually the less healthy it is for you. But any treatment, whatever the treatment is, if any treatment that seeks to take away the symptoms and all it does is take away the symptoms is going to be ineffective, truly, truly ineffective. Uh, because the problem lies much deeper than that. If you had bad fruit and you had bad leaves, well, the solution is not just to pick off those bad fruit and bad leaves because the problem goes deeper than that. Now, again, if you had pain and you had severe pain in your back and uh, you took some pain medication, over-the-counter pain medication for it or some herbs or other things like that and took the edge off of it, but you still had severe pain in the back and you go to see the doctor, doctor gives you stronger medication and you still have severe pain in your back and, and so on and you finally go see another one, well, hopefully somebody eventually does an exam and figures out what the cause of the problem is. Because if the cause of the problem is a knife in your back, well, you can take all the herbs and all the medication that you want to. It's just not going to fix the problem of the knife in your back. We need to understand what the cause is and get to the cause. Now, 
the use of anti-pain herbs or anti-pain medication or other things of that nature in the context of having a cause of this nature is not necessarily wrong, right? Uh, it's not necessarily wrong to, to, to take something to alleviate the pain while you're in the, the midst of that painful situation. Uh, but to rely upon that as the solution uh, is going to leave you in a difficult situation because it's just not going to resolve the cause because the cause is deeper than that. Now, again, we mentioned that symptoms are uncomfortable. And the reason that symptoms are uncomfortable is because they're there to alert us that something is wrong. And just like a fire alarm is uncomfortable, it's very loud. It's made to be annoying. It's made to get your attention because there is a need to wake you up when there's a problem that's underlying it that isn't necessarily so loud and isn't necessarily so obviously detectable, right? So <clears throat> if you were sleeping at night in another part of the house while the house started catching on fire, well, it would be good to have a smoke alarm or some other alarm in the home that could wah, 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 or, or whatever it does in order to wake you up so that you could be uh, aware that there's a problem so that you can actually do something about it. That's It's important, right? And none of us would consider that the alarm is bad, right? We all consider that the alarm is good. And it's true that the alarm is good, it's just bad that one has to have an alarm. <laughs> it would be it better to never have to have an alarm. Um, but the alarm is on the good side of things. It's the fire and the smoke that's the problem. And if our response to the alarm going off, which is going off because of the fire, if our response to that is to simply put a pillow over the alarm and you know tape it in place so that we don't have to stand there holding the pillar of the alarm so that we can go back to sleep, that's obviously not going to be a great response. It's not going to turn out well because you're just going to end up being in a greater and greater problem associated with the, the fire that is looking at consuming the building, right? Um, so, so to simply treat the symptoms, to simply pluck off the bad fruit and bad leaves uh, is really not the, the final solution when it comes to uh, having health problems where we have symptoms that present. Now, uh, of course, the fruit and the leaves don't grow by themselves. They grow off the branches and the branches represent our behaviors. Your behaviors are the simple things that you do, breathing, drinking, eating, uh, exposing to the sun, opening your eyes, closing your eyes, whatever it is, depending on uh, what it is that's that's needed. And uh, of course, if you have a good branch, then it's going to promote good fruit and good leaves. If you have got a bad branch, then it's going to promote bad fruit and bad leaves. And it's appropriate to uh, adjust an individual's behaviors. Um, and it's appropriate if you have a fruit, if you have like a fruit tree that has a bad section, it's appropriate to prune, right? That's perfectly fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the question is, is that going to solve the problem? And uh, the answer to that is usually it's not going to solve the problem. It just helps to relieve the burden of disease. And when it comes to behaviors, if we start thinking about modifying behaviors, the question is, how are we going to modify? And in relation to what, right? So what is the standard that you're going to modify by in order to make sure that things function, that work well? Is the symptoms the standard? Well, the answer is no, the symptoms aren't the standard. If the behaviors are right, then it's going to impact the, the symptoms in the right direction, right? So that if you've got right behaviors, then it's going to start bringing about resolving the negative symptoms, right? It'll lead in that direction. And, and so that you could say, all right, well, that's maybe part of the measure. Um, <clears throat> but really, the measure is the needs because the needs can never change. You need oxygen and you need a certain amount of oxygen. You need water and you need a certain amount of water. You need food and you need a certain uh, amount of and type of food in order for you to uh, live 
and to do well. And if your behaviors reflect the needs so that you supply what you need, well, then that's going to work out well, and it's going to result in those symptoms going away and things improving and you having good fruit and good leaves. But if your behaviors do not reflect the needs so that you are either not providing enough of what is needed or you're providing too much of what was needed, then uh, or you're providing something that wasn't needed, well, then that's that's going to create problems and it's going to show itself in the health of the tree and the leaves and the fruit and, and so on. Right. And <clears throat> one thing that we do recognize about uh about our needs is that everything that we need comes from outside of us the oxygen that you need the food that you need the water that you need the everything that you need comes from outside of you and the reason that you have your behaviors your breathing drinking eating is because you have your needs and the behaviors are there for you to take what you need and bring it into yourself so everybody must take what they need that is outside of them and bring it inside of them that they might live. And <clears throat> so the, you know, the oxygen that you need, uh, if it stays right there at your nose or at your lips or even in your nose or even in your mouth or even in your airway, but doesn't actually get down into your lungs and then into your bloodstream and to the rest of the body, well, you're, you're not going to die. It's got to come in and it's got to become a part of you in order for you to live. And the water, if it stays outside of you or close to you, or even in the upper part of uh, you here, you're still gonna die. You're not gonna live until it comes in and it becomes a part of you. And it's true for everything that we need. Everything is outside of us and everything must be brought inside of us. And we need what we need because we are what we are and we can't change what we are. And that might be a heretical statement in this days of Earth's history where everything appears to be relative. And, uh, and apparently anybody can choose what they are and so on and so forth. And the answer is, you know, and the response to that is, no, you can't choose what you are. You are what you are. And you can't change what you need. You, you need what you need. And you can deny that you need that particular thing uh, mentally as a part of your deception. Uh, but you cannot actually stop needing what you need. And uh, if you cut yourself off from the supply of what you need and you don't take from it because you don't think that you need it, well, you can't help it. Symptoms are coming. They're coming. Right. And, 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 and they'll teach you. The symptoms will teach you. The fire alarm will teach you. No, that's a problem. You were wrong. Right? You were wrong. And, uh, and so, no, we can't change what we need. And so the need in the, the ends up being the, the fulcrum. You know, you have a teeter-totter. And uh, the teeter-totter goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Well, that point that doesn't go up and down on the teeter-totter, that's called the fulcrum. Uh, that's the point that doesn't move up and down or side to side, even when the, when the teeter-totter is going up and down. So <clears throat> your, your behaviors do and can go up and down. And your symptoms can go up and down and so on. But it's only the needs that stay still. That one. So there is your fulcrum. There is your standard. There is the in, immovable, right? Uh, this is the unchangeable. And and so everything has to float around the unchangeable. And if you if you truly want balance, well, then you've got to balance the behaviors against the needs so that so that it's it supplies what is needed and then everything functions the way that it's supposed to but you just you don't just breathe you don't just drink and you don't just eat automatically right now they the digestion process is an automatic process god created you to digest a certain way and uh, and the respiratory process is an automatic process but there is a choice of bringing it in, but then you don't have much of a choice of how it is processed, right? So that choice of bringing it in is dependent upon your beliefs, 
right? It's dependent upon your beliefs. So yes, you need oxygen. It doesn't just blow into you. You've got to breathe. You need water. It doesn't just flow into you. You've got to drink. You need food. It doesn't just walk into you, hopefully. Uh, you've got to eat. And, uh, and so we see from this that everything first takes what it needs and brings it in. And then what does it do? It then gives way and ministers to others. Because, you know, if you kept every bite of food that you ate or every breath of air that you breathed or every drink of uh, some kind of liquid that you drank, um, if you kept it all, well, then you would be huge, absolutely huge. No, you only keep just a little bit of it, just, you know, so far of of all of my years of eating, breathing, drinking, I've only kept this much, <laughs> right, so far. Uh, which is very little compared to everything that I have uh, taken in. So every, it's taken in, it's used, it's passed along, right? And, uh, and so the foundation of my behaviors is my beliefs. And what you believe will manifest in how you behave, right? If I believe that I need um, uh, Twinkies, well, then what am I going to do? Well, then I'm going to eat Twinkies, right? And if I believe that I need deep fried Twinkies, <laughs> I'm going to eat deep fried Twinkies. But do I need it? The answer is no, you don't. Are there components in it that you do need? Yes, there are certain components in it that you do need. You do need sugar, right? Not in that quantity, and it's probably not best in that particular form, but you can live off of sugar. If you were on a, you know, uh, if you were on a boat and you were stranded in a boat and it actually happened to be a sugar boat or sugar cane boat or something like that, and all the other food ran, uh, you know, ran out and you're still stuck on that boat and you're waiting for somebody to come rescue you, well, yeah, you can eat the sugar, right? You can eat it. Um, and it'll you'll get to live a bit longer because you got that sugar and you have the energy associated with it. Um, so it does have things that you need, but it's got things that you don't need and it's got it in quantities that you don't need it. And so if you believe you need it, but it doesn't match your needs, then your behavior is not going to supply what you need. And then you're going to end up with bad fruit and bad leaves. The, the symptoms are kind of the, what should I say? They're kind of the thermometer of how things are going, right? Uh, the symptoms are there to to kind of be a final you you look at this and you go okay well hang on how are we doing uh as far as our as our beliefs and our behaviors are concerned but really the fulcrum of all of it is the needs again you got that fulcrum that's the point that doesn't go up and down and uh, what you're looking for is balance and ultimately that balance comes in what you believe but it will manifest itself in how you behave. And the result of that will be the kinds of symptoms that you have or the, the fruit and the leaves that you produce from that standpoint. And finally, uh, if you have a tree that has bad fruit and bad leaves, the ultimate uh, place where that problem is going to originate is going to be in the soil. Because uh, the tree, as an immobile uh, creation, immobile for life form. Uh, it doesn't have the ability to go and seek for a source. It must have what it needs brought to it. Right? And uh, if the if the soil does not contain enough of what it needs, then it's going to have problems. If it's deficient in water, if it's deficient in uh, needed nutrients and other things like that. Um, if you've ever had fruit, there's a thing called a BRICS index. And uh, it's a way of measuring the sugar content in the fruit. And it gives an idea of uh, what the soil quality is like that the tree is growing in. If the soil quality is really good, then you're going to have a higher BRICS index or a higher sugar content in the fruit. Uh, and it shows that it's healthier. Um, and, uh, but if you, you can have too much, you can plant those fruit trees in a hole that is lined with clay that tends to collect all the water and then you can overwater it or, you know, monsoon season and other things like that in an area that's not used to having monsoons and the plants can just get rotted and, uh, problems because there's just too much water. 
And of course, you can give them the wrong stuff and you can you can water the trees with diesel or gasoline or oil or other things like that. And they're just not going to do well because they weren't created to function off of those things. So the sources are important, right? It's important. Now, we need oxygen, we need water, we need food. We also need love, right? Every one of us needs love. And uh, that's, a, that's a need that it's a little bit easier for us to deny that we need it because it's not physical. And so uh, it's easier for us to ignore the, the spiritual things, the spiritual needs. Um, and as with any need, that which we need comes from outside of us. So the love comes from outside of us as well. It doesn't come from inside. Uh, I remember <laughs> arguing with a, I wasn't arguing, but anyways, I was I was uh, speaking in, um, where was I? I was in downtown, uh, I was in Serbia and I was in the capital. What's the capital of Serbia? Um, Anyway, so I was in the capital of Serbia and I was speaking downtown and I had a crowd and, and it's a fairly secular um, environment there. And so I was presenting this idea that that uh, we need love and so therefore we can't produce love. And there was a woman in the audience and she was very adamant that she could produce love, right? That she was the source of it. And uh, so I was, you know, praying and thinking, okay, Lord, how do I... How do I get around this one? And the thought came to me, well, okay, if you're the source of love, then if you're put in solitary confinement, then you should be just fine, right? should be just fine. So solitary confinement wouldn't be an issue. You can, you can supply all of the love, which includes acceptance and belonging and harmony and security and compassion and all these different things. Uh, you can produce all that you need to, and you don't have any need. As long as you've got some food delivered to you, some water delivered to you, a bathroom, a bed, some sunlight and whatever, um, you should be fine without anybody else for the rest of your life. But solitary confinement doesn't work that way. Right. One of the reasons that it's so effective is because individuals do need love. And uh, and so she started thinking about that and she continued coming to the rest of the lectures, even when we introduced God. And she actually did quite well through the through the rest of all of it. But um, but yes, we need love. Right. And it comes from outside of us. And who is it that must bring it in? Well, it's ourselves. Right. Just like we must breathe. We must drink. We must eat. So we must bring in the love. And of course, the question is, how do you do that? Well, if you get a love letter and you feel loved after reading the love letter, then how did you bring in the love? Because there's no love in the ink. There's no love in the paper. There's no love in the glue. Um, the, there's nothing that you can find in the letter that you can extract physically and say that, okay, that is love, right? Um, because love is not physical. Uh, you can't measure it. You can't weigh it. It doesn't have a density. Um, you can't put it under a microscope and identify where it is. You can't gather uh, quantities of it together and then inject it in somebody. And now all of a sudden they have love and they can love. Uh, there, there's just no such thing. It's spiritual. It's not physical. But what is the nature of that spiritual thing that we call love? Well, it's information. It's information that means love, right? So you read the love letter, and on that love letter, it has information, contains information. And that information is in the, in the form of pen on paper with lines and squigglies and straight lines and circles and other things like that. And we're taught that this squiggle means this is this letter and this squiggle is that letter. And these letters together mean this word and this word has this meaning. And these words together have this meaning and these strings of words together has this meaning. And so what we do is we take the information that there is in a, that's there in the physical form that was put there from a spiritual origin, right? It was put there from a spiritual origin. It came from the mind of an individual, uh, which has a spirit, and then is 
through the through physical structure of the body and the pen written on the paper and that information is carried and contained in a physical form and then when it gets to you you interpret it you read it you understand it, you unpack it basically and what you understand as the result of it is that this means love and when to you it means love and you accept who you understand it's coming from and you accept that they love you and you believe it now it's yours right. now it's yours if you don't believe the letter if you think it's false if you think it's a, a scam or something like that and it's from the used car salesman or it's from president biden or whoever and and so on well then you just you throw it off and it doesn't benefit you Right. Maybe you even get more mad that <laughs> that it came or you're just amused by it and, and whatever, but you don't really feel love. It's when you understand who it comes from and you accept it as coming from them, then it becomes yours and now you're loved. Right. So it is a process of thinking. It's a process of evaluating information, determining the meaning of it, which it means love and believing it, then it becomes yours. And that's the process of accepting love. And so that is, you know, it's just like the process of respiration or digestion and so on. You have that process, but spiritually, mentally, right, that happens. And uh, yes, you need love. I need love. Everybody needs love. Um, and it's the greatest of our needs. You can go for you know, over a month without food. Some of you are probably saying, oh, no, 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 I'm too skinny. I can't go for a month. All right. Well, you can go weeks without food. You can go days without water. You can go minutes without oxygen. But as love is the basis of thinking, and it's the it's the need of the mind, it's the need of the spirit, it's the need of thinking, that once that turns off, right? I mean, if you stop eating, well, you can go for a while. If you stop drinking, eh, you can still go for a while. You stop breathing, eh, you can go for a little while. If you stop thinking, that's it. You're done. Right. It's the greatest need, the greatest need that we have. And in fact, how do we know that that's the case? Well, for the sake of love, you would be willing to give up all of the rest of it. Right. Uh, truly, if you you would be willing to let go of your physical needs in order to retain that of love. And we see that in the lives of the martyrs. We, we see that in the lives of those who sacrifice themselves for, for someone else or for a cause that they hold dear, right? Um, love is the, is the greatest need. It's the greatest need of the human. And, um, and so, but there's a problem, and that is, what about the source? I mean, what we believe about love will, uh, I mean, that's part of the thinking process. Uh, that will determine how we take it in, and it will determine this whole balance component, because there's balance needed from that standpoint as well. But the source is a really important part. Where do we get our love from? Who, who should it be? And most of us have grown up in a situation in a, with a nature where we're backwards, upside down, and we see other people as the source of the love that we need. And so we go after them and we go after them as the source. But how many trees would live if they tried to live from trees? Right. If, if, if this tree tried to use another tree to be the thing that it grew out of so that it could live, and then that tree lived off of another tree, uh, lived off of another tree, 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 and round and round and round and round, and then that last one back into this one in order to live, what would happen with that whole system? Well, it eventually die. Because all of the trees have all of the same needs, and none of the trees can supply that need for another without giving it up themselves, which means that they're going to die. And so if this one gives it up itself to the next one, and the next one gives it up to the next one, and 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 the next one, and, all, and none of them are plugged into the actual source that doesn't need it, well, then they're all going to die. Right. They're all going to die. 
the only way you can live is you got to have a source that doesn't need what you need. That's what you got to have. And so we find that everything that functions functions by law. And the laws that govern function are unchangeable. You, you just can't change them. Our understanding of what those laws are can change from time to time. For example, gravity. Uh, you know, we have the Newtonian idea of gravity, which is what most of us, you know, learned in school. And that's the idea that you have some, some mass and then you have some other mass and they have kind of a... a, a you know, attractive force between the two of them and the bigger the masses and the closer they are, then the more that they attract to each other until oh, they're locked, kind of locked together. Yes. Well, then theory of relativity came along and and uh, Einstein came along. He says, well, no, actually what it is, is it's a mass warps space time. And so space time, we can imagine being kind of like a mesh that's stretched out and uh, not terribly tightly. And if you put a ball, a heavy ball, like a bowling ball on top of that mesh, well, then it'll cause that mesh to kind of sag down a little bit. Well, anything that's within a distance of that sagging down will start having a downhill motion to it. And if it's a little thing, then it doesn't pull down that mesh very much. But if it's a bigger thing, it pulls it down even more. And as it gets closer to the other one, it gets pulled even more you know what? well who cares who cares it doesn't matter gravity is what gravity is it doesn't matter what our understanding of it is our understanding might change and our understanding might be wrong it might be wrong again might be wrong again but gravity still is what it is it's unchangeable and uh and so prof proper function is really only maintained by remaining within the law that governs the function of whatever the thing in question is. And dysfunction really is the result of going outside of the law. Right? And, um, and so there's then a fundamental law of all nature. Everything in creation is subject to this fundamental law. There are certain laws in nature that are only applicable under certain circumstances and uh, certain environmental conditions. But this fundamental law is applicable everywhere at all times without exception uh, and uh, it, throughout all of creation. And that is that nothing exists from itself. So that means that, uh, that all things in creation came from something and has a need for something outside of itself. It needs material in order to exist. It needs power in order to exist and function. It needs resources and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's always needs. Everything in creation is dependent. This is what it, the, the first thing shows us. Nothing exists from itself. Everything in creation is dependent. Okay? It's got to have something from outside of itself in order to exist, in order to function, in order to live. And then the second part of it is that nothing exists for itself. So that means everything in creation is dependent upon other things by which it exists, but exists not for itself. It exists to do something, to accomplish something, to pass something along. And, but, and other things in creation benefit from what you do and what you pass along and so on. And so everything, if we summarize it, everything takes in order to give. Everything takes to give, takes to give, takes to give. It doesn't matter if it's animate, doesn't matter if it's inanimate, doesn't matter if you consider that it has life or it's not living. If it's anything that exists in a part of creation, then it takes to give, no matter what. And the basis that taking to give gives us the thermodynamics, where we say that all energy necessary for a system to function must come from outside that system. So in order for anything to be to function, then it has to have power from outside in order for it to be powered. And from this comes cause and effect. That says that every effect must have a cause, and every cause must produce an effect. Because if you've got a cause, then it's going to do something. And if you have an effect, something did it, right? And so if you have an effect, well, there has to be a cause. And the cause is not where the effect is. The cause is always outside of where the effect is. And so all of these come from the fundamental law. 
and which is the law of life, and it is taking to give. And as everything functions according to this law, then, uh, then if you have some kind of treatment, and that treatment that you take is for the purpose of taking away a symptom or a set of symptoms, right? Let's say, for instance, you've got a runny nose, right? So you got allergies and you got a runny nose and your nose is running and you take a medication to stop the nose from running. Okay, so if you successfully remove the symptom, now you no longer have a runny nose because of the medication that you took. But the cause of the symptom, which is associated with the behaviors, but is deeper than that, it's associated with the needs, but it's deeper than that. It's associated with beliefs and then therefore your sources. So if the cause is down here underground, but the manifestation is above ground, and all you do is take care of the manifestation, well, by law, the cause must manifest itself somehow. And so if you successfully remove the effect without removing the cause, if you take care of the symptom without the cause underlying it, now the cause must reveal itself some other way. And so it must produce side effects, right? So side effects are by law, by law. You must have side effects. And it doesn't matter if it's a drug, doesn't matter if it's an herb, doesn't matter if it's water, right? Even water has side effects, right? Um, <laughs> You're like, what do you mean? You know, yeah, people are going to die from water. Uh, yeah, actually, a lot of people do. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, uh, uh, now, if you have something that is there simply to supply what you need, then there's not side effects associated with that, with supplying your need, right? So if you are dehydrated and you need water and you take in water, then the taking in of that water is not going to have side effects associated with it because that's doing things how it's created to work, right? Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the medication, that kind of stuff, it's, and yeah, you can get side effects associated with it. As long as the treatment does not address the cause, but it only addresses the effect, then it must manifest side effects somehow. That's just how it goes. Now, also health, we can understand it from a road standpoint. And on that road of health, there's proper function and it's comfortable. And we like comfort. And this is really the part that we focus on is the comfort part of things. And there's things that you need in order to be healthy and to function properly, like oxygen and water and food that we talked about before and warmth as well, sunshine and so on. Uh, and all of these things are needed within a particular set of confines, right? You can have too much oxygen or too little oxygen. You can have too much water or too little water. You can have too much food or too little food. You can have too much warmth or too little warmth and so on, right? All of these things have an upper boundary and a lower boundary. And once you go outside of that boundary, you start having dysfunction and it's uncomfortable, right? And that's by design. It's created that way. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we were created for health. We were created for proper function and comfort and to take things in that we needed to. We were not created for dysfunction and discomfort. That's the result of going outside of the road. But what is it that defines the boundary of the road? That is defined by law, right? So there is law that, got, that defines the boundary of the road. And as long as you're inside the law, you have health, proper function, and comfort. If you're outside the law, then you have dysfunction, discomfort, and more stuff. So if your temperature goes up and it goes up above the law, now you start feeling bad. And that's called symptoms. You start feeling hot and uh, you're uncomfortable. And there's certain things that you can do in order to try to get your temperature back down, like sweating and uh, fanning your stuff, turning the fan on, turning the air on, whatever it is, drinking cold water, what, taking a cold shower, something in order to get your temperature back down. And once your temperature gets back down within the law, then you start having comfort again, things are functioning properly and, and you're okay. You know, you don't need to keep pushing it. But if your temperature goes in the opposite direction, well, you're going to feel bad as well, but you're going to feel bad a different way. 
You don't feel bad the same way going off the road one side as you do going off the road the other side, because if you did, you wouldn't ever know what to do about it, right? You would never know what to do about it. If you went, if you felt hot when your temperature went up and you felt hot when your temperature went down, what would you do when you felt hot? Well, if you felt hot when your temperature went down and you start fanning yourself and you start sweating and you start turning the air on and drinking cold water, what are you going to do? You're just going to continue getting colder and colder and feeling hotter and hotter and doing everything to make yourself get actually colder and colder. And so you'll kill yourself really quickly. So when you feel hot, you do things to go back into the confines of the law. And when you feel cold, you do things the other way to go back into the confines of the law. You cover up, you drink hot things, you take a hot bath, you, you know, you shiver and, and, and whatever. And it's praise God that he made it in such a way that if you go out the law one way, it feels one way. And if you go out the law the other way, it feels another way so that you can know what to do in order to get back, right? And if you don't stop, and those symptoms are like the rumble strips on the side of the road to let you know you're getting off the road, right? And that's good. That's good. The symptoms have a good function to let you know there's a problem. If you don't stop there and you keep going, then it's going to end up in disease. And disease is where you have more dysfunction, more discomfort, and you've got to do more in order to get back into the confines of the law, because the farther you go from the road, the more you have to do in order to get back on the road. And at some point, you're going to be you're going to be willing to accept help or even ask for help in the process. Um, you know, as as it gets more and more uncomfortable, you're more and more willing to accept somebody else's help in helping you get back into uh, proper function. And it goes in the opposite direction as well. Frostbite, chill blains up here, you know, uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. And you get to the point where you really desperately need to do something significant about it right now, or things are going to get really bad, really bad. And you finally, well, okay. Chronic symptom care. Uh, to treat symptoms on a on an acute basis, short term basis, like you know, cut off your finger or some kind of trauma injury, that's one thing, right? And then, uh, there's ne not necessarily a problem with that. But when we take chronic and when we take uh, symptom care and we put it over the long term, there's a lot of problems associated with it because the the symptoms. Let's say that we're talking about pain right, in this particular case. The symptom of pain is there to let you know that you've gone off the road, that you're outside of the law. And it's there to let you know there's a problem and you need to do something about the problem. Right. The pain is not there for you to ignore. Because if you ignore the symptom, if you ignore the pain, then you're likely to simply just go off the road and keep going off the road. One of the reasons that it's so dangerous to have um, uh, leprosy is the fact that it eats away at the nerves and deadens the nerves so that you can't feel pain anymore. And, and what do individuals do? They end up destroying themselves because they just can't feel the pain that would keep them from doing that destruction. Uh, one of the one of the stories that's told is of a, of a you know physician that worked in the leprosorium. Uh, I don't remember what country this was in where he was working, but it was a leper colony that he was working amongst. And he had an old fashioned you know Coke bottle. I don't know what it had in it. Some kind of soft drink, and you know it has those those tops where you need the you need the uh, the bottle top opener to get it off. And sometimes you can. You can get it with your teeth, but you don't want to do that very often because then the teeth start breaking. And I think we have a dental hygienist in here and they're probably saying, oh, no, don't ever do that. And uh, anyway, so he was trying to get the top of that bottle off and he just couldn't get it off. And this 12 year old boy walked up and he's like, here, I'll help you. And he grabs the bottle and he goes and he gets the top off and he hands it to the to the doctor. And the doctor's like, Whoa how did you do? I mean, I was struggling and I couldn't get that. How did you get that off? And he gets the boy and he opens his hand and the boy's hand is all cut up. 
it's all cut up and it's bleeding. Right? He was a leper. And he didn't feel the pain. So he could put a lot of pressure on there and he could just get that bottle off when if he had been able to feel the pain, he would have stopped and stopped injuring himself. But he didn't have that signal, so he injured himself. And so that's why, you know, lepers a lot of times would end up losing fingers and hands and toes, and no, you know, and, and so on, because they can injure themselves without having that pain signal. Pain is good. It's 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 not good to have pain, but it's good to be able to have pain because it lets you know something's wrong so you can stop it and go back. Now, what happens if now I have pain and the response to the pain is for me to take a medication or an herb or some kind of treatment to take the pain away or to reduce the pain? Well, then what it does is it essentially makes the road look wider, right? So I start taking the pain medication, the road looks wider. If I take a bigger pain medication, the road looks even wider, right? When I go back, here's the normal. And then here's the road on the pain medication. Here's the road on the bigger pain medication. So it just makes the road look like it's wider. So I can go farther, farther, farther before I ever get that signal that something's wrong. And that's a problem. Because now I can be outside of the law but I have no signal that I'm outside of the law because I just took the signal away by my treatment. That's a problem because now I don't have a motivation to do anything about it, to get back. And the whole reason for the symptoms is to motivate you to look for the cause so that you can do something about it so that you can get back within the confines of the law. So it does become problematic. Now, if I don't stop at symptoms and disease, I keep going, well, then eventually there's death. You go from, uh, from discomfort to progressive discomfort, and you go from dysfunction until you finally get to no function on either side. And yes, there's this gray zone called the point of no return, and this is where an individual is still alive, but they're so far from the road, they're not getting back. Right? And, and I've seen that, you know, physically as an ER doc and working in the hospital and clinics and, and so on. I've seen people get to the point of no return. We can do anything that we want to. and we, They're still alive. And we're working hard on them. But no matter what we do, they're not coming back. Right? They eventually die. Um, so you don't want to get there, right? You don't want to get there. And this is how things work from a law basis. And there's something else that we need. We need love. And love also functions similarly in that there's a law that governs the function of love. And that if we go outside of that law, we can have symptoms, disease, and death. Now, a thing that I want to differentiate, and I, this picture is slightly problematic in regards to that. And that is when it comes to any physical thing that we need, there's limits. There's upper limits and lower limits, right? So there's, you can have too much oxygen, you can have too much water, too much food, too much warmth, all that kind of stuff, as well as too little. When it comes to your spiritual needs, you can never have too much. You can never have too much, but you can definitely have too little, right? There, there's no such thing as too much love, <laughs> Right. Uh, but there definitely is a deficiency of love, and that can be a problem. So health is proper function, which is the effect of staying within the law. And disease is dysfunction, which is, which is the effect of going outside of the law. And symptoms of disease are like the uh, fire alarm and the rumble strip. They're good. Right? The fire alarm is good. The rumble strips are good. We don't like them because they indicate that there's a problem. And they're, they're annoying, but they're there for a good reason. They're to let us know that there's a problem. Okay. So every effect must have a cause. No exception to that. And every cause produces an effect. Well, there's no exception to that. And if the effect is present, then guess what? Well, the cause is also present. That's what we learned from the, cause of, the law of cause and effect. And if the cause is removed, then the effect must go away. Okay. Now, if it's been a time, a, in a process of time in, it, in its development, then when the cause is removed, then there can be a process of time in its regression. But it needs to start regressing right at that moment. 
And there is no effect that can produce itself at all, ever, because the effect is the manifestation of the materials and the power and the resources that went into it. And that power and material resources came from outside of it. So the effect doesn't produce it itself. And so you'll never find an effect without a cause. Never, never, never. And that means that there is no such thing as chance. There is nothing that is truly random, right? These are all uh, human concepts that are very consistent with evolutionary theory. But there is really no such thing in, uh, in this world. The Proverbs 26 and verse 2 says, the curse causeless shall not come. There is nothing where there's an effect that doesn't have a cause. That's what it's telling us. And we're also told that in the laws of God and nature, effect follows cause with unerring certainty. And the will of God establishes a connection between cause and its effects. So just examining this, we see in the laws of God in nature, all right, so these are God's laws, and we see it in nature, effect follows cause with unerring certainty. There's one thing that's unerring, and that is God. So if effect follows cause with unerring certainty, then who is it that has associated every effect with every cause? The answer is it's God. God has set up every effect for every cause. That's his doing. Right? And we see that the will of God establishes the connection between cause and its effects. It's God's will to do so. And, uh, and it's for us. It's for our good. It's not for our curse or whatever. It's for our good. <laughs> because if there wasn't an effect, we would never notice the cause. Because it's the effect that we notice. It's not the cause that we notice. And so we could have a cause in place that was not good. But if we had no effect associated with it, then we'd have no clue that it was there. And we would have no motivation to do anything about it. So God does that. So that means every effect is God's business. Every effect is God's business. And the effect is never wrong. It's always right. Because the effect will show whether the cause was right or wrong. If the effect is bad, the cause was bad. If the effect is good, the cause was good. The effect will always manifest according to the cause. Right? And God has made that, set that up himself. So when we talk about law and getting outside the law and dysfunction and discomfort, then we talk about breaking the law or getting outside of the law. And what do we call that? Well, in civil situations, we call it um, a crime or a misdemeanor or something of that nature. In a moral standpoint, we call it sin. And in sin, which law is broken? Well, it's God's law which is the, is the law, right, the moral law. And what is the foundation of God's law? Well, it's love, right? And so we can then conclude that disease, which is the result of going outside of the law, is actually the result of a love problem. And you might not say, you, know, you might say, well, you know, I mean, going outside the law of sodium levels or going outside of the law of body temperature or other things like that, is it really going outside the law of God? Well, <clears throat> to go outside of any law is to go outside of a law that God has created because he's the creator of all of them. And there's a fundamental law. Remember, we talked about that, the fundamental law of all nature, that nothing exists from itself and nothing exists for itself. And that fundamental law says that everything takes in order to give. It takes in order to give. Well, where does that come from? Well, the first, second, third, fourth. All right. So, all right, so the fourth commandment, says that we are to take everything that we need from God so that we might be full and satisfied and we can rest. And he's the creator. He's the source of everything. Right? So we come to him and we take everything that we need. And then the fifth commandment says that we should give all that we need to others. All the other commandments tell us don't take like this, don't take 
from here and so on. Don't take from here. Don't take like this. And so the law essentially tells us take to give, take to give, take to give. Hmm. So what's the fundamental law of all nature? Take to give. And upon what is that is built upon that? Well, every other physical law, including thermodynamics and cause of an effect and, and so on. So the fundamental law of all nature is the law of God, which is taking to give, which is his moral law, but is also the foundation of the physical law. So if I break the physical law, I'm also breaking the moral law because it's all one. It's all the same thing. And so disease, yes, is the result of a love problem. It's the result of sin. And we are told there is divinely appointed connection between sin and disease. No physician can practice for a month without seeing this illustrated. If he will be observing and honest, he cannot help acknowledging that sin and disease bear to each other the relationship of cause and effect. Right. So, uh, you know, and then we might look at it, we might go, oh, you know, so now are we going to point out everybody's sin because everybody has, you know, got disease and so on? Well, uh, do we condemn anybody for having sin, uh, for having disease? No. Do you condemn anybody for having sin? No. We were born as sinners. <laughs> I mean, sorry. We were born with sinful nature, and sinful nature leads us into the sinful acts to be a sinner, right? Uh, are you responsible for the nature that you were born with? Well, the answer is no. You're not responsible for how you're born or who you're born to or what nature you were born with. You have no responsibility for that. But that sinful nature is deceptive and it's destructive. And so that sinful nature deceives you and it destroys you. And as we operate by that sinful nature and in harmony with that sinful nature, it will result in destruction and it will result in uh, damage and death and so on. It's, that's just the natural consequence of it. Now, are we guilty because of that? No, no. But if we uh, what should I say? But God wants to save us from it. He wants to save us from it so that uh, we don't continue to destroy ourselves and destroy others through that sinful nature because he has a better option for us. Right? So yes, there's a divinely pointed connection between sin and disease. Is it always the individual's sin? No, not always. But disease is always, without exception, the result of sin. Always, without exception, the result of sin. There is no disease ever that is not the result of sin. You might say, well, Job. Well, yes, but it was the result of Satan's sin. Right? You might say, well, uh, what about those kids that were coming down sick and uh, Flint, Michigan, because they were drinking the water that was contaminated by pollution and all that kind of stuff. It was pollution. So, yeah, where did the pollution come from? Did it come from righteousness? Did it come from God's creation and how he created things to function? Or did it come because of the effects of what sin had done on creation and, pre, you know, pre producing or rearranging molecules to make things that are poisonous and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's the result of sin, Satan's sin, man's sin, you know, and its effect on, on nature and so on and so forth. Yeah, so, so it's still the effect of sin. Um, <clears throat> so disease is always the result of sin. There's no exception to it, but it's not always the individual sin. Well, no physician can practice for uh, a month without seeing this illustrated. If he will be observing and honest, he cannot help acknowledging that sin and disease bear to each other the relationship of cause and effect. It's there, right? It's there. Well, what about the man born blind, right? Jesus, uh, the disciples pointed him out and said, did this man sin or did his parents sin? You know, and Jesus said, well, why are you asking that question, right? You guys are confused. It's you're focusing on the wrong issue. It's just just recognize that now God's name can be glorified because of His healing. Right? Now, is it that 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 there was no sin there? No, there was. There was. There there couldn't be blindness without it. Right. Now, was it the man's sin or the parents' sin? Wrong question. 
<laughs> wrong question. That's what Jesus is saying. Wrong question, right? Uh, Ellen White talks about that particular passage in a number of different places. And she mentions very specifically, it's not because there wasn't sin. There was sin, right? But the Jews had come to the place where they believed that the greater the sinner, the greater the suffering, right? So an individual who suffered more was obviously a greater sinner, and that reasoning, which was wrong, would lead them to reject Jesus, who would become the greatest sufferer, because he would take all of the sin of humanity upon himself. And so it would lead to his own rejection. And so he was trying to break that tie, break that thought process, which was wrong, and, uh, and prevent him from being rejected by others, because that was their only hope of salvation, is to accept <laughs> him as their savior and his salvation that he came to bring all right well that's good enough for today um we will look at more things later um but those are those are some things uh in regards to you know just some foundational issues that we can begin with when looking at health and healing and disease and so on uh and to have a context for it uh, in which we can then build on over the next few weeks as we continue to look at um, some health-related uh, topics and where disease comes from, and where does health come from, and uh, what, what grounds do we have for health and healing? When can it be expected? How can it be expected? And so on. So I'm going to pray, and then we can transition into our question and answer time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. What an awesome God you are. And we just ask for you to work mightily and abundantly. We thank you for doing so. Thank you for creating us in such marvelous ways. Help us to understand how to cooperate with you and how to trust you and that you might bring about your goodness in our lives and bring about your salvation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And uh, for those of you that are new, uh, there's the little hand feature. You can raise your hand uh, to ask questions. Uh, if you unmute yourself and uh, and then wait, I usually know that you're waiting on the on the edges or or whatever. Or you can put in the chat. You can uh, type questions in the chat. And if you want it to be a private question, you can send it directly to me. Nobody else sees it, but then I read it off and and then uh, you know we talk about it as well. And so those different ways of uh, going about the question and answer session. Uh, so I've got BJ's hand first and then Jan. So when you were talking about the point of no return and you mentioned that you've seen um, people be, be at that point, they're still alive, but it just takes some time because there's no going back. So does that mean that the appointed time for the thinking that the appointed time for someone to pass away is not under God's control? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I see you, Candida. I'll get back to you in just a minute, but you got background noise there. Um, so, uh, uh, it, no, it, what should I say? There is cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. And the cause of disease is not in God's control. He's not the author of disease, right? Correct. He's not the author of sin, right? Correct. Um, he is the author of good, of righteousness, of truth, and, and so on. And that's exactly what we need for health. Uh, it's Satan, who's the enemy, um, who m mysteriously deceived himself and, you know, and perpetuates the lies and so on and so forth. And uh, so an enemy has done this, right? And we have been born in the enemy's camp. And so we cooperate with him un unbeknownst to us. 
And, and so can an individual by the, uh, the choices that they make in the context of their deception hasten their demise? And the answer is yes, they can, right? And can individuals, when they come to understand the truth and then make choices in harmony with the truth under the influence of the Spirit of God, can they uh, delay that demise and improve their life uh, in that context? And the answer is yes. Right. Yes, they can. And uh, uh, so, <clears throat> but there is a point at which nature does not have that which God created humanity to function as and function with. There, there's a point where you you can go so far and then you can't get back from it naturally, right? Of course, God, you know, Jesus, he, he healed Lazarus after, after four days of being dead, you know? So from God's standpoint, there's no point of no return. But from a human standpoint, oh yeah, there can be. Um, you know, for example, uh, one of the cases that I had in the emergency department was an elderly gentleman that had an abdo abdominal aortic aneurysm. And so, you know, the got the heart pumping here and you got the big tube coming out the aorta that comes down and then comes down into the heart. I mean, into the abdomen and then goes splits into the iliacs and goes down into the femorals and down into the legs and so on. Well, the abdominal aorta is usually about two centimeters uh, around, but you can have it so that it balloons and it gets bigger, 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 bigger. Well, the bigger it gets, the thinner the wall is, the more pressure that's inside it there, the more difficult it is to maintain, and eventually it gets big enough where it can pop. And so that's a really big blood vessel. It's got a good portion of all of the blood coming out of the heart going through it. And when it goes pop, and then blood starts coming out into other parts of the body and not just through the rest of the circulatory system. Well, he might still be alive, but it's not very long before you're gonna run out of blood in the circulation. And, um, and so we knew that he was starting to go and he was still alive. And we told his family and we told him to say their last goodbyes. And it was a few minutes and he was gone. Right. He was still alive. Well, there wasn't, it, it, you know, with his age and his condition and so on, and what had just happened and the timing of it and so on, there wasn't anything that we could do to, to keep it from going. Right. So you do have situations where an individual has come to the end of the capacity of the body and uh, its repairing mechanisms where you've gone far enough and there's no coming back, right? Um, and that's what I would call the point of no return. Does it mean that God can't get somebody back miraculously? Oh yeah, he could if he decides to, right? Okay, so should I save my second question or do I get to ask all of them now? Go ahead. So when you talked about cause, causes, are causes always spiritual? Yes. Yes. Causes are always spiritual um, <clears throat> at the origin of it. But my interaction with it might not be on the from the spiritual origin of it. For example, um, the 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 origin of a toxin that I may come into contact with was a spiritual origin because it was the devil working with not, you know, elements that God had created and rearranging them and so on and so forth and making a poison and humans participating in that and amplifying it and, you know, and whatever and whatever. And then I came into contact with it in a physical form, but it did have a spiritual origin. Right. Um, and, uh, and so it always has a spiritual origin because, because it's only something that is spiritual that can go outside of a law. Something that's physical 
can never go outside of the law that governs its function. Never. It's impossible. It, it's only something that's spiritual that can go outside the law that governs its function. <clears throat> and uh, so it always has a spiritual origin. So the cause is, is always spiritual. But then it's like a domino, like a chain of dominoes. Mm -hmm. Then there can be there can be several several dominoes along the way before I then interact with that chain of dominoes, and then have the effects associated with it. So should we always, when when we say ascertain the cause, should we always immediately look for the spiritual? Yes, yes. I mean, that's gonna that's gonna take you back to the origin of it, and if you can identify the origin of it, then you can track the you know the certain components along the way, the different dominoes along the way, and go, oh, okay, this is where I interacted with it, and, and, and you know, and so on. Mm. And, uh, but yes, you're 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 always looking for the for the spiritual origin. Um, you know, if it's inheritance. What are you going to do about it? Well, you can't. Uh, if it's a chemical exposure that you already had, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, unless you can, if you can, uh, um, you know, unless you can, uh, uh, watch. Sorry, I saw a comment in the chat and then I just lost my train of thought. What was I just saying? What are you going to do about it if you can ascertain? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. The things that you can't do anything about. So you can't do anything about inheritance. If you already had a trauma that happened in the past, you know, you got cut or burned or whatever, that kind of stuff. You can't do anything about that either. Um, after the, you know, after the event has happened, uh, you can do something about helping the healing process along the way, but you can't do anything about the trauma itself that happened. And if you had some kind of chemical exposure, then, well, that's not something that you can do about. You can't do anything about anything that was in the past. You can only do what's in the present. Right? That's all that you can deal with is what's in the present. And um, that's all you have a responsibility for is you know, going, okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? And all you can do is what's in the present. You can't do anything about what was in the past. Um, so, uh, so take that responsibility in the present, recognize that it's not your body, it's God's, and you're only the steward of it, not the owner. And so come to him and go, okay, Lord, what would you have me to do in this moment and in this condition and in this case? And, um, you know, and then look at dealing with it from that standpoint. Jan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay. Um, let me try to put this in the right words. So I have a friend who has a book. It's, it, I think the title is uh, The Spiritual Roots of Disease. And it'll give the disease and it will give what the spiritual root of that disease is. Is that, um, is, is that like uh, a guarantee that that is the spiritual root or is that just kind of like, you know, they're maybe they're, they've, they've studied it and they, it seems to be the, the, the cause most of the time. Um, and then, I've, I've always had a problem with, um, like, uh, hormonal issues, like forever. And, um, just wondering, do you know that what the spiritual root of that would be, or do I have to figure that out? Cause I don't know what it is. All right. Um, so I know what the foundational spiritual root is for every disease process that you may have that comes through your own mind, right? And that foundational root cause is the false identity that I am God. And that false identity that I am God 
causes me to separate myself from him. This is what we're born into with sinful nature. I'm, I'm just describing sinful nature, right? Um, this is what we're born into. So I believe that I'm God. So I cut off from God, but I'm still a creature that's dependent. So I reach out and I attach to others as my source. I was created for good. So I need others to be good for me, but they're not so good for me. And so when I take from them, I don't get the good that I need. And I don't like that. <clears throat> I was created for gain, not for loss. But when I have others as my source, I can't help but lose. And when I'm God in, my, in the way I approach things, but I'm not actually God <laughs> because I'm only a creature, then I try to control things that are outside of myself. I see things as a problem outside of me. I try to control all of those problems. I try to resolve those problems. I can't do it. I see it as my problem. I try to bring it to success, but I can't bring it to success. I see things as belonging to me and people as belonging to me. And so if the things or the people are affected, then it's my loss. And... Uh, I, as a God, I need to be worshipped. So I need others to love me. I need them to accept me, to understand me, to uh, give me belonging. I need them to, you know, honor me and other things of that nature. And, um, and I'm my own judge. And so I judge others based upon my standard and I'm a pretty harsh judge. And so if they don't meet up to it, then I have resentment and bitterness and I judge myself and I'm a pretty hard judge on myself. And so if I don't meet up to my, my judgment, then I have resentment and bitterness. And I mean, so I have self-resentment and I have guilt and I have self-hatred and, and, and things of that nature. And, and so um, I see myself as my own. And so what is done is done to me. And so it's personal. And it's then my problem and something that I have to fix. And if I'm God, but I'm not actually God, then my love I see as coming from myself. And but I I actually need love. And so in this weird way, I give love away, love, but I do so in order to receive love back again because I need the love. And and um and so everything is backwards. Everything is upside down. It's the basis of sinful fallen human nature. It's how we're born. It's our mindset as we're growing up. It's, you know, we see it throughout the world. We see it throughout our parents. Most of the time, our, the, the way we have understood our Christian religion has not fixed the problem. Um, it's only put Christianity within the context of the problem, but not actually exposed it and, you know, fixed it and turned it around. Um, and so we end up destroying ourselves, uh, by our, by our sinful nature and our thinking and our thought processes, because we were created with a mind to govern the body and to control the functions of the body well but the mind can only do that under the influence of truth because we were created for the truth, not for error. And so when it's error, that's the foundation of the mind, then the mind can't control the body the way that it's supposed to. And dysfunction is the result. And that dysfunction can be generalized, you know? So if you have a thought of fear, you know, the dog comes racing at you with a foaming mouth and all that kind of stuff, you can have a thought of fear. And with that, panic can set in, you can... I mean, you get signals sent down to the adrenals. Adrenals are releasing epinephrine, norepinephrine. Your heart rate increases. Your blood pressure goes up. Your pupils dilate. Your blood clotting factors go up. Your liver starts dumping sugar, and you know, blood flow diverts from the skin to the to the muscles and the brain. And you know, all these things happen. It's a generalized response to a thought a thought of fear. But you can also have very specific localized dysfunction that happens because you have specific thoughts coming from a particular part of the cortex, which then is attached through the wires, the nerves, through the rest of the body to a particular location in the body, and you can have a manifestation in a spot here or a spot there, which we're going to get into more 
next week as we as we continue discussing about health and and uh, you know on these types of things. Now, in relation to that particular book, uh, there are observations that can be made uh, from clinicians who have taken care of individuals that actually ask the questions and you know find out what's going on here and how does that result. Um, and those are observations. Are they, are they a law? The answer is no, it's not a law. It's just an observation. And so to the degree that the observation is correct is the degree to which you can rely upon it. If it's law, it's 100% of the time. It's always the case. And that's what we want to be based upon. We don't want to be based upon just observations. We want to, be, we want to have our faith and our understanding on a firm foundation. And a firm foundation is something that cannot change. That is always 100%. You don't want something that's even 99%. You want something that's 100%. Um, <clears throat> so what is it that controls hormones? It's ultimately the mind. It's the mind that controls and regulates the release of hormones from uh, the ovaries, from the uh, testes, from the adrenal glands, from the thyroid from you know from all the different uh, hormone secreting organs endocrine organs in the body uh, it's the mind that controls and regulates all of that and again it was created to do so under the influence of truth and if the regulation is not happening well then we can ask ourselves the question okay what's the problem where's the problem coming from and next week we're going to be looking at um we're going to be looking at the five different causes of dysfunction in the body. Um, so I don't want to run too far ahead uh, because, uh, you know, then we take away a lot of our, <laughs> our points for next week. But, uh, but the issues of the mind are not the only reasons that an individual can have dysfunction. And, um, you know, and I think it would be Good to bring that question back up next week in relation to now the five different causes of dysfunction, because one of those causes of dysfunction um, is, well, I'll just mention what they are. It's inheritance, right? So that's one cause of dysfunction. It's trauma. So too much pressure, too little pressure, too much temperature, too little temperature, burning, freezing, smashing, crushing, cutting, other things like that. Chemicals, so you can have you know access to chemicals that can uh, result in dysfunction. The mind, which is ninety percent of the time, is the the pathway through which the dysfunction comes. And then the enemy, right? Like Job, where it was the enemy's direct attack on Job that uh, led to his uh, his dysfunction. Right? Well, may I ask real quick before you go on to C C Cecilia, mm -hmm. so if it is the mind, are you going to go into that, like what to do, you know, for to kind of try to correct the problem? I know you've like last week you were going, you know, over the index cards and re the replacement therapy, um, or I don't know if that's what you called it, but you know, replacing the error with the truth. Is that what, where you're headed with that? Yes, yes. But even that process needs to be a, what should I say? If you simply try to replace the, the, the negative thoughts with the truth of the word, God's word, but you do so as an exercise to fix the broken mind with the broken mind. It's never going to work. Because you can't fix what's broken with what's broken. Right? You can only fix what's broken with what is working. And so there has to be a connection between the broken and the working in order for the working to help that which is broken to work. And so there has to be a connection first between the individual and God, who's the source of the healing, and a surrender to him and his will. 
And then in the context of surrender, now I can cooperate with God in what he would have me to do to cooperate with him in restoration. And those three by five cards and then taking the thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ is, is a response to then the surrender that has already happened in the connection with God. And now I am taking from his goodness, not mine, because I don't have any. And I'm taking from his unbroken, correctly functioning nature. Because mine is broken and it's not functioning and I can't just do it myself. And so there's got to be that connection that, that happens there. Right. All right. Um, let's see. It was, oh, did she go? She went. She went out. All right. Um, I had a question in the chat before Cecilia put her hand up. Uh, if Job was your friend, how would you comfort him when he was despairing and lost everything? It's a good question. Right? Uh, it's a very good question because the the there is a very real danger that to understand the sin disease connection that sinful fallen human nature will take that as a club and beat somebody with it right and discourage them with it and indeed that's what you know, I mean, I don't think they intended to do it, but that's what Job's friends end up doing with him because they're saying, well, obviously you had to sin because you have this condition. Uh, again, when next week, when we go over things, one of the causes of disease we'll look at is the enemy. Right? So it was the enemy's sin, not Job's sin. And I never have the right to condemn another individual uh, because of disease that they might have or whatever, because all right, it, well, it could be the enemy, right? And how do I know if it's not the enemy, right? It could be the mind. And how do I know it's not the mind? I have to ask questions, right? I have to ask questions. I have to under, I have to seek to understand what the individual believes and, and uh, have them voice it and express it. And the only things that I can pick up on are when an individual expresses error, right? And if they express error in the process of asking questions, then I can know that, okay, there is error, at least, right? There is at least error. And so then let's explore this error. Where's the foundation of this error? Let's go follow it through. And if it fits the pattern, then I can go, okay, well, yeah, there might be other causes that, you know, there might be inheritance, there might be other things that are there, but there is error that's here, and you can't fix inheritance, but you can fix error. You and Jesus, right? Me and Jesus can, we can, we can fix the error by the truth. And, uh, and so, and what I encourage individuals with also is that they're born with sinful fallen human nature, which they're not responsible for. And yes, disease is, you know, comes as a result of that, but I don't blame you for that either, right? I don't blame you for that either. Let's just see if we can find what the cause is and let's get it removed, you know, so that you and <laughs> there's nothing between you and your savior and there's, you know, and you can be free from this thing as well, right? And uh, I suppose if I was smart, enough and i was back in job's day i can't say that i am but if i was smart enough and i was back in job's day um the, and i listened to job's responses then i would go okay well i don't know maybe you know maybe it's not in his own mind because every response that he's giving makes sense and it's right you know and i don't see anything necessarily wrong with what he's saying and uh and and okay what's going on well he Job didn't know what's going on during the trial. He didn't know that it was it was the enemy. He was blaming God, right? And God took the responsibility because he allowed Satan to do that. Um, did the friends know what was going on? No, they didn't know what was going on either. But you just have to take things in the, you know, in the context in which they are and then go, okay, well, 
All right. Well, I ask questions and you look like you got good answers and things are coming out the right way. And and you seem to understand things you know, right and you have a right relationship with God and this thing is still happening. All right. Well, we scratch our heads and we go, I don't know. But God loves you. <laughs> and uh, and you're not forsaken of him because he never forsakes you. And uh, and can you hope in him? Yes, you can hope in him. Can you trust in him? Yes, you can trust in him. How is this going to turn out? We don't know how this is going to turn out, except we know that he's coming again. We know he's coming again. And we know that when he comes and he takes us home, there will be no more pain, no more disease, no more tears, no more crying, no more, no more suffering, no more any of that kind of stuff. And so we have hope coming even if we don't know what might happen in those next few months, weeks, years, whatever. Right. Cecilia. Thank you. I'm just, I just got uh, questions like, um, what about, like say, um, my husband, he's not a believer but because I became an Adventist after I married and he got like things in the house that you classify as, you know, like belonging to the enemy, like, you know, because like, Phantom comics and things like that. So what do I do? Because as a wife, he does his stuff. I can't touch his stuff, you know. So how do you, how do you go about that? You know, like, like I can't do anything about it. So saying it's, you know, our our son, he's adult, and you know, he got probably things that you know, I doesn't want it to be in the home. But what do you do? Yes. All right. So that's the first question. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's do the first question, and then you can ask the next one next. Um, so, so in this case, and, and, um, um, I'm going to, I'm just going to mute you while I'm answering the question, because what ends up happening is these little blips come through and then the screens change and all that kind of stuff. And anyways, it's, it's, it's harder in the editing process, but, um, <clears throat> so, uh, and then, and then when I'm done answering this question, you can unmute and ask, ask the next one. Um, and so, yes, in that case, you have no responsibility for the, you know, for the magazines that are sitting around and all of that kind of stuff or the things that your, your son has exposure to. Um, you only have a responsibility for how you deal with things and how you relate to things that are in your management, right? And uh, so, you know, on your, on your husband's side of the table of the bed, then he's got all these magazines. On your side, you have a Bible. Um, on, you know, in his section over here, he's got the TV on, he's playing this kind of stuff. Uh, if you watch TV, you watch God stuff. Um, you know, whatever programming that that um, is glorifying God, you know, sermons or other, whatever it is, you know. Uh, and so your example to your son is an example of Christ likeness. You have no responsibility for what your husband's example is to your son. None whatsoever. That's his own responsibility. Um, and, uh, and so your privilege is to, you know, as long as your husband wants to stay with you uh, in this context, is to, is to be that light and to be that example to both of them in an imperfect context because right? we're all in, in an imperfect context to one degree or another. Um, and, you know, and then praying and asking for the Lord to intervene and asking for him to continue influencing your son and your husband with the truth as well, so that by, uh, by a loving, consistent example, that the Holy Spirit might use that as a means of conviction upon your son and your husband, uh, that they might surrender to God and follow in a similar, in a similar way, right? Um, but you have no responsibility for how your husband turns out. You have no responsibility for how your son turns out. You only have a responsibility for how you relate to your son and for how you relate to your husband. And so it's a moment by moment, Lord, what would you have me to do now? How would you know, what would reflect your life and your character best and, and continuing to do so and then trusting in the Lord that he's going to work the end results out uh, to the way that he knows is going to work out best. Okay. And you had a second question. 
Yes. Have you heard of this theory called the chaos theory? Because uh, the, somebody asked me about neurophysics. Then the inventor of neurophysics like to help people rehab in rehabilitation, um, you know, to get the physically like you know in the wheelchair they can get up using using this method like even the gym equipment. But you based on chaos theory as far as I understand this neurophysics is chaos theory in how many, uh, in God's principle because I don't know much about chaos theory. Do you have you heard about that? I don't know. I have not looked into or studied chaos theory, so I can't I can't comment on that intelligently. I'd have to research it and then come back to it later. Mm. Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, before I get to you, Faluki, I have uh, some uh, uh, I have another message here in the chat. I have three huge situations that have happened to me in life. I just went through a divorce where he was unfaithful for years. I had a pregnancy termination due to HG sickness during this time. Uh, I also have past childhood trauma with my parents on drugs. Through the divorce, I got close to God and it has really been my strength. Like I feel very joyful with God daily because I focus on him. Even though I feel good overall, I have decided to do therapy because feelings do come up sometimes as is recent, um, as it is recent, and I don't want to suppress anything. But I wonder by doing therapy if I am dwelling on the past. How do I know I'm getting past the situation and not just suppressing it? How do I do therapy without dwelling on the past? Do I just stay focused on God and do not do therapy so I am not thinking about the past? All right, good questions, really good questions. So um, we are told that in a multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. Um, but we're also told that to trust in man is, um, a man that trusts in man is, uh, is a, that's not a fool. Let me find the uh, actual quote. It's Jeremiah 17, and it should begin in... Uh, verse five, and it says, oh, cursed is the man who trusts in man, right, and makes flesh his arm, right, so it's, uh, it's an individual who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, uh, is one that's going to be cursed, and then in two, late, two, two verses later, in verse seven, it says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is in the Lord, so the only one that can ever fix us is God. I mean, he's the one that's unbroken. We're the ones that are broken. And so if we go to somebody else that's broken in order to fix, uh, you know, to help to fix us, then it's like connecting your computer that's virus infected with another computer that's virus infected in order to be fixed. The only utility that a counselor has is to bring you to Christ, right? That's really the utility of a counselor. It's to is to help an individual who's confused into uh, as to how to connect with God and to take from Him to help disciple them along in the process of connecting with God and taking from Him. Uh, if you're ever in a process where you're where you're in a counseling situation and you be, you become dependent upon the counselor, that's never good. That's never good at all. And if I'm in that situation where I have somebody that's dependent upon me, then that's not very good at all. And uh, one of the things that I have to maintain in the counseling process is, is to never become dependent upon anybody that I'm counseling with, which means that I'm not dependent upon their outcomes or anything of that nature. I'm simply coming to God and saying, okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? What's your truth? How can I share your truth in such a way that, that so-and-so can come on uh, a step further and a step further to learning to trust in you and helping to understand where the thought processes are wrong uh, in an individual so that the truth can be presented in that context to help them get across what they don't understand, right? <clears throat> and how they can't see, um, you know, coming to freedom. Can that happen without a counselor? Well, yes, it can happen without a counselor. It can happen with, uh, you know, God, God is not dependent just upon an, an individual as a counselor. 
Um, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit is a good counselor as well. And the word of God is a really good counselor as well. Uh, if you read Psalm 119, then the law of God is a very good counselor as well. And, um, and so on. So spending time with God, studying his word, understanding his character, praying and asking for the Holy Spirit's intervention, um, looking for uh, godly individuals that are around you that, that obviously have a clear walk with God that can, that can, you know, direct you in the steps that are a bit difficult along the way, or that's beneficial. Um, but not to be there forever. And uh, how do you know whether you are, um, you know, how do you relate to the past as opposed to dealing with things in the present? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what um, or how many times or what the particular issue was as far as the past is concerned. The thing that affects you is your current beliefs and your current um, your your current attitude, your current thought processes. So, for example, uh, an individual could be abused years ago, and they could be still affected by it today. But what is affecting them today is not the abuse that happened years ago; it's the thought process that they have associated with abuse that they carry with them to today. So do I need to go into the past and somehow fix the past? Well, no, I can't. You can't. None of us can. We only have one example. We only have one thing to help. Past, and that's the cross, right? We can come to the cross and accept the divine exchange of Christ in our behalf. And he takes our past and we get him. Praise the God. Hallelujah. Right. But as, but all we can do is deal with the present. And so we come in the present and we, we <clears throat> assess with God's help our thoughts to see if they're in harmony with the word of God. And where we find our thoughts out of harmony with the word of God, then we connect with God and trust in him. And we ask him to give us his thoughts and we come to the word of God and we start re replacing those lies, those errors with the truth of God's word and cooperating with God in that process as he's doing it with us as well. And, uh, and then, um, you know, and then those thought processes currently are fixed. And if the current thought process is fixed, and I believe the truth, where I had a problem in the past because I was being, believing the lie, I don't have to go go to the past and fix it, because when I fix it in the present, then everything that was related to that lie in the past gets resolved. It, it just gets resolved, because the only reason it's a problem right now is because it's currently a wrong thought process that continues, a lie that I still believe. Um, and, uh, and when that lie is resolved, then it doesn't have that power to, you know, to control me or to cause me to go in that particular direction anymore. And, uh, so yes, you don't have to dig up the past. You don't have to, you know, sit and think through all of these different times and how many times did this happen and who, you know, and all that kind of stuff. No, but sometimes it is beneficial to think back to an, to a, particular incident case or a very problematic case and uh and then just explore it with god you know and go okay lord when that happened where were you right where were you can you know where i felt like i was all alone but was i really all alone were you there with me obviously you were there with me because you said i will never leave you nor forsake you um, so, so where were you what, what was my wrong response in that situation because obviously I still have a problem with it. So that means that I still have a problem. And, uh, and so what was the problem with that? What did I believe that was not right? And what was the truth? What is the truth in opposition to that? Um, but does that mean that you have to go through every situation, every circumstance? No, you don't have to. It's, it's just seeking to understand where the lies are. And then with God seeking to replace the lies with the truth. And when you replace it now, then anything in the past that was related to that lie gets resolved. Okay. 
All right, uh, Faluke. Thank you. So I'm trying to apply the law of life in the context of a marriage relationship. So Bible say, husband love your wife. And then, um, so husband's supposed to love their wife by giving them affection and um, companionship. And then the woman respect. What in the case that the husband say, oh, I don't want to give you affection anymore. I don't want to be your companion anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't see Jesus to give you that. Jesus used human being as a conduit. Mm -hmm. That. So in this case, there is no one to be used as a conduit to give the spouse that. So okay. would say in that case, how will the spouse find, I mean, get that? Because God used human being as a in that kind of husband and wife relationship. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> all right. So, all right. Let's just take that situation, that scenario. Um, and uh, so you have uh, two individuals that are married and you have uh, one individual, in this case, the husband that is not behaving Christ-like and uh, is not being affectionate, as you mentioned. And then you have the other individual who is supposed to respect them, but respect is usually considered to be in the context of being, uh, you know, being, uh, having affection expressed towards you, being, you know, somebody being compassionate towards you and being, you know, your companion and other things of that nature. All right. So where does respect come from? Does respect come from your spouse or does respect come from God? Well, respect comes from God, doesn't come from your spouse. Uh, if you're waiting for your spouse to have respect before you respect them, you're going to be waiting a long time. And uh, the, the commandments don't indicate that you have to that you have to have respectable individuals that you respect, right? Respect is uh, something that you, you, how you interact and how you relate to others, regardless of what they're like. It doesn't say that if your mother and your father are honorable, or your husband is honorable, or whatever, that you honor them, or they're respectful, that you respect them. No, it just says to do it. But what's the basis upon which you do it? The basis upon which you do it is the fact that God is honorable and that he is respectful and God is your source. And so you come to God and you take all of the respect and the honor that you need so that you have respect and you have honor. And now you go to your spouse, you go to your parents, you go to your children, you go to whoever it is, and you interact with them in a way that is respectful and that is honorable. Why? Because you have respect, because you have honor, and you then manifest that to the other individual, regardless of what they're like, regardless of whether they're affectionate or not, regardless of whether they're being a good companion or not, and, and, and so on. Because honor doesn't depend upon another person's actions and reactions to be honorable and respectful. It doesn't, it doesn't need that. It needs God to be respectful and honorable because he's my source. I take from him. Now, what if you're in a, in a marriage situation where you have both people that are disconnected from God and they're depending upon each other? And so, you know, it's the usual context. That's where, you know, most marriages are at where, uh, you know, you're dependent upon your spouse to be good so that you can be good back to your spouse. Well, what if you're in that situation? Well, it's chaos, it's a problem, and it's going to end up in badness, 
right? Um, and it's probably not official terminology, but anyways, uh, the marriage is just going to go downhill because and because the the husband is not being affectionate and the wife is not happy with that and she's uh you know she's not going to be respectful if he's not going to be affectionate and you know and then if she's not being respectful then why is he going to be why is he ever going to be convinced to be affectionate again if she doesn't respect him and so the high cycle just feeds into itself and it just goes down and down and down until you know, and then the marriage relationship is done. And that's usually where it goes. Doesn't have to, but it usually goes there because that's, we have the wrong perspective. And we, we think that we need the other person to be good to us in order for us to be good in return. Now, in the background, we know that that's not right, but in practice, that's how we deal with it. And that's how we live. And if it doesn't go that way, then we got problems. Sorry, that's not good English. We have problems. Yeah. I think, yeah, in, in that case, both of them are not taken from God. Mm -hmm. If in the case, the woman is taken from God, but the man is not taken from God by not showing affection and not being say, oh, I'm out. And right. not, but the woman still need affection and companionship. Okay. Right. So if the man says, I'm out, I'm not there anymore to give that. All right. So the woman now have to be praying to God, Lord, help me to keep my body under control so that it will not, she will not go and be looking for affection and companionship in the wrong places. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's the, a, a woman doesn't need affection and, and companionship from a man as her source. She doesn't. And if she thinks she does, it's a lie. And it's a dangerous one, right? There's a reason that God, um, sorry, I'm going to mute while we're talking. Um, there's a reason that God created Adam alone before he created Eve with all of the other creatures. They were all created at the same time. But he created Adam alone without Eve. And he had alone time with Adam without Eve. And then he put Adam to sleep. He didn't have to put Adam to sleep. I mean, he can do surgery painlessly. He can say, here, Adam, look, there's your rib. Right? Oh, that's pretty cool. Look what I'm going to do. Right? No, he put Adam to sleep. He didn't have to put Adam to sleep. He put him to sleep on purpose. And then he had alone time with Eve. Right? Now, what was, the, what was the purpose for the alone time between Adam and God and Eve and God? It was so that each of them could have their own individual relationship with God apart from each other. And they could recognize that they were satisfied completely by God himself without another human being. Right? He was sufficient to satisfy them as a source. But God created Adam and Eve not just to take and to fill. God created Adam and Eve to take in order to give. Right. So the fullness of their creation necessitated that they would not only take and be full, which they could do from God alone, but also that they could give. <clears throat> now, since God created them with certain capacities and abilities that were above and beyond any other creature that was on the planet, then when Adam took from God and gave to the animals, there was still something missing. There were certain things that he could not give because the animals didn't have the capacity to receive. So he couldn't talk with the animals about his, his thoughts in regards to the beauty of this thing and the, how that smelled and how it made him feel and other things of that nature. So he didn't have somebody to give to to the degree that he had the capacity to give. And that's where he recognized that he was alone. 
It wasn't because his taking was insufficient. No, he was sufficient from God. God was sufficient. I mean, God was sufficient for him. He could take everything that he needed and he could be full. But it was the giving where there was a deficiency because he didn't have somebody of his similar nature and similar qualities and character to be able to give to. That's where it broke down. And that's where he recognized and, and that's where God spoke to and said, it's not good that man should be alone. Then God puts Adam to sleep and God has the same experience with Eve. He interacts with her and he does so on a one-on-one -on -one basis. She comes to recognize that she everything that she needs from God is, is great and, and she's fulfilled from him. But there's nothing of her same nature in order for her to give to, to be able to express all of the joy and the wonder and the, you know, and so on of what she has taken from God and how she's, you know, and so she recognizes her need as well of someone to be able to give to from what she has taken from God. And then God wakes up Adam and the two of them are now able in a full sense to be able to take from God and be supplied and full, and then give to each other uh, to the degree and the capacity that God created them to. Right? And, uh, and so then there's that fullness that's there. So in the context of you having one person that's connected to God and the other person that's disconnected, the husband that's disconnected, the wife that's connected. All right, everything you need, including in affection and compassion and a companionship from a need basis right something that you need to to have and take in all of that comes from god and you can get all of that from him right but then there's a giving right and if the other individual is not there and they're not available and they're not willing to accept well, now there's a deficiency from the giving standpoint, not because you're not willing to give, but because they're not willing to receive. Now, can you give to others? Well, yes, you can. Or maybe there's children. Maybe there's church members. Maybe there's others. You can, you can talk to others about the, you know, the wonder of God and his great love for you and how he's satisfying your needs and the beauty that he's put in your life and giving praises and other things of that nature. Um, does uh, does somebody need uh, sexual expression in order to live? The answer is no. Yeah, plenty of plenty of people live without sex, and people and plenty of people have never had sex at all in their life, and they live. It's not a need; it's a plus. It's a benefit, right? Uh, within the context of a certain relationship, right? Um, and uh, so, can one go without that? while you have God as your source? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes, you can. Um, and, uh, you know, and are you looking for a day when you could have, be able to be that same channel with the, you know, with the spouse and, and be able to fulfill their needs because they would be willing to ex accept it and not as, as a source, but as a channel that they'd be willing to accept that and, and, um, you know, and, and can have that, uh, you know, that giving, that taking from God and giving to each other? Well, sure. And is it is wrong to, to desire that good for them? Well, no. But sinful nature steps in and it deceives us very trickily. I mean, it's very tricky. And, uh, you know, we can very much be thinking that we have the other's best interest in mind when we're really thinking of ourselves. How do you know? Well, when things don't go well. And when things don't go well, then when I start hurting for me and pitying myself and feeling bad for myself and so on and so forth, then I can know that my motivation for what I was wanting or trying that didn't work out was for me. It wasn't for them. Um, you know, so that's a, that's a self thing. I, I can't see it for somebody else except that I talk to them and ask them questions and then find out what's going on. Um, and do I condemn anybody for that? No, I mean, it's our sinful fallen human nature, but it's miserable and God wants to save us from it. And he wants to set us free. Right. So praise God. Hallelujah. There's a way that he can set us free and let's enter into that way.
so that we can be filled with God, we can be satisfied by him, and then we can give to at least those that are willing around us in ways that God ordains at this time. All right, a couple more things down here in the chat. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> when you talked about the point of no return, can you give an example of a uh, spiritual point of no return? Is that when the conscience is hardened and final, finally settled in lies? Yes, yes. Uh, Satan. When was Satan's point of no return? That was... That was um, after he had been, you know, involved in his nefarious deeds up in heaven for a while. And then God had the council meeting and pointed out to Satan that he was wrong and God was right. And, and he came to acknowledge that it was true. God was right and he was wrong. Um, and then he began to think about things and he began to go, oh, but what about all the people that I've, you know, led astray and what are they going to think? And what about my position? And pride started stepping in, in the context of knowing that he was wrong and that he was going in the wrong direction. He decided to continue doing so. How could he do that? It's a mystery, but he broke his conscience at that time. And there was nothing to be able to bring him back. Nothing that could ever bring him back at that point. Uh, so yes, he, he had a broken conscience at that point, and that would be a, a evidence of a point of no return. Uh, another question. So if a person never accepts God's word to replace their thoughts, uh, they will never be healed. Uh, in, in its truest sense, yes, that's absolutely true, because uh, ultimately healing uh, comes with, uh, with salvation and with eternal life. Uh, to to have a temporary healing, but then to die and face judgment and be lost forever is, I mean, can we really call that healing? No. Um, you know, so so healing is always in, in association with, with salvation and with eternal life. Um, can an individual uh, do things as far as diet and lifestyle and other things like that. And this particular disease goes away because they've improved the, um, the, their cooperation with the law that governs the function of their being, even if they're an atheist or an agnostic. Well, yes, yes. And does lifestyle and natural remedies and other things like that have an effect, whether you believe in God or not? Well, yes, because God has, has ordained that these things might have benefits. But true health, true healing uh, is only the response of perfect righteousness. And that only comes in Christ. And we only have access to that by faith. And, um, and, and so that's really our only basis and our only foundation, which we'll be talking about in a couple more weeks uh, when we get to that. Uh, here's another question. How do you direct someone who's hurting and persists in talking about their problem for hours and is too disturbed to spend time praying about it? Would it be good to limit FaceTime? Is personal prayer for the person the only recourse? Um, so yes, if you have an individual that reverts often to their own problems um, and they continue focusing on the problem and they won't be diverted from it, they don't want to pray and so on, um, and, uh, and whatever, then yes, it's good to limit FaceTime uh, for their sake, right? Um, and to pray and ask for God to help you to have wisdom to know when to intervene and under what circumstances. It may be that they need more, can more, uh, what should I say? It may be that they need some more consequences in order to bring them to the point to realize that they actually really have need of God. Um, if you have an individual that's constantly talking about themselves and their problems, then there's a very big pride problem, even though it's a poor me, poor me, poor me type of problem. That's called what, what we would call hidden pride. Obvious pride is like, oh, look at me, look at me. I'm so wonderful. I'm so good and so on. But hidden pride is like, oh, poor me, poor me. I'm so miserable and I'm so this and whatever. But the, still the focus is self itself. And, um, and uh, yes, it's good to direct an individual away from that. If you have somebody that's stuck in that, one of the best things is if they could ever be 
brought to see somebody else's need and start helping out in their need, you know, going to an old folks home or going to helping the homeless or uh, other situations where it becomes clear that others have greater needs than I do. And to start reaching out and helping with those needs, that would be wonderful for a person of that nature. Um, but if they will not be turned from their self-focus, even God himself won't turn them from their self-focus and he will let them be right and it may be that you need to you know that you need to do so um but it could be beneficial and under the influence of the holy spirit to come back from time to time and see if they will be redirected in a different direction and will see things from that standpoint um, and it's okay to do so, but it's also okay to back off. Um, Jesus, he, he was available for individuals. Many people came to him, and he never turned anybody away, but he also never chased anybody. He never went after running after anyone. If they didn't want him and they didn't come, he didn't go after them. And he made himself available, but he didn't go after them. And, uh, and it would help us to, to follow that example as well. Um, and, uh, and so on. Uh, here's a quote that was shared. Those who before inspired by love took God at his word and found their highest pleasure in watching their revealings of his love now put their own minds in place of God's word and reasoned that all was wrong. Yeah. And that was a... Yeah. Okay. If you had more to say, then then you can say it. It was a little bit broken up on this side. Um, how to help people see you don't see them as bad, but the problem is their deceived choices. You can't guarantee how somebody sees something, right? Um, and it's it's not your responsibility to make sure that somebody sees something a certain way it's only your responsibility to speak the truth and to do so in love and leave it to the lord to bring conviction to the heart of the individual um, so if they see you as bad and they don't recognize that it's own, their own bad choices that's their own problem and their own perception and it's not your responsibility to fix that it's only your responsibility to speak the truth in love. And again, leave it in God's hands for him to fix, uh, to, to work with the individual so that he can bring things on to conviction and to solution. All right, we're over our time. And uh, I think it's time for us to pray and go. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what an awesome God you are. You really are an awesome God. And Lord, as we, we think of these things, as we consider these things, as we seek to understand them, <clears throat> I know we've only gone over partial stuff. We've got more stuff to go over in the next weeks to come. Um, but Lord, help us to see and understand and uh, to apply these truths from your word, the principles from your word uh, in our lives. And uh, may we experience the freedom in you and be better and better channels of your grace to others as we understand more of the truth and can ex live it and express it better to others. This we pray and we thank you for working abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen.